ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له وما يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله وبعد خير الحديث كتاب الله وخير الحدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار we begin by praising allah we praise him we seek his help and we ask for his forgiveness we take refuge with allah from the evil of ourselves and from the evil consequence of our evil actions whomsoever allah guides no one can misguide but whomsoever allah leaves to go astray no one can guide and i testify that allah alone is worthy of worship and that muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is his servant and his messenger after that the best speech is the book of allah the best way is the way of muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the worst thing in the religion are those matters that have been newly introduced and every matter that is newly introduced into the religion of islam is an innovation a bid'ah all of these religious innovations are misguidance all misguidance is going astray and all going astray is in the fire my dear brothers and sisters in islam assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh mashallah i can see you've been well taught by sheikh hussein brothers and sisters life is a journey life is a journey it's an analogy it's a descriptive term that is used by many different people in many different cultures in many different societies about life that life is a journey and no doubt we are all born into this world and we pass through different stages and we all are reaching a destination which nobody disagrees about there is one destination which no human being or at least a sane or in an intelligible human being disagrees about that we are all reaching a destination and that destination is death so there is no doubt that all of us muslim non-muslim rich and poor whatever country or language or tribe or section of society we may belong to all of us are going through this journey and this journey will end for all of us and this is something we all agree about in our death and no one knows when is this moment of death the old die and the young die the rich die and the poor die the educated die and the illiterate die everyone dies every soul will most certainly taste death and no one is going to escape death no one is going to escape it brothers and sisters the wise person is the one who reflects on this but the controversy the disagreement is not about the reality of death and the disagreement is not about life being a journey the disagreement is about what happens next what happens after death this is the disagreement 
For some, there is nothing. The atheist claims that death is the end of everything. For Hindus and for Buddhists, life is an endless cycle of birth and rebirth. That when we die, we are reincarnated. And according to this idea, the things you do in this life affect how you are reincarnated in the next. In Hinduism, you must follow the Dharma, the way, the natural order of things as Hinduism interprets it. Which according to you could say, if there is such a thing as Hindu orthodoxy, which is questionable anyway, you must follow exactly the system or the caste system into which you have been born. And if you follow it correctly and you submit to it and you adhere to this natural order and you avoid bad karma, you avoid doing bad things that will affect your next reincarnated life, then you will be reincarnated as a superior being. So if you are from the very lower classes, you will move up a class and so on and so on and so forth. And the ultimate is to reach a type of divine status. Not divine in the sense of we understand as Muslims Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No, because the concept of the divine is very different. In Hinduism, generally, the whole universe is God. Everything is God. You are God. I am God. The stage is God. The animals are God. The trees are God. Everything is God. But you reach a certain level of transcendence and you transcend your mortality. So this is the final stage. So also in Hinduism, most certainly life is a journey. And what you do in this life is going to affect your next life and your next life and your next life. And if you do bad, of course, then you will go backwards. You will go down. Now there is a fundamental problem with this philosophy. And Buddhists also have a similar idea, except Buddhists do not believe that you need to adhere to the caste system in order to be able to reach some goodness in, in the reincarnated life. In fact, they believe whatever your caste, whatever your level in society, whoever you are, you could reach enlightenment in this life. Nirvana. It actually means annihilation. And you reach this also type of state of divinity in a sense. But both Buddhism and Hinduism suffer from a logical flaw. The logical flaw is how do you progress upwards if you are an ant or a cow or a sheep or a dog or a snake or a rat? Since the people I have spoken to and discuss this with agree that animals do not have rational choice. They do not distinguish between good and evil and right and wrong. So if they can't distinguish between good and evil and right and wrong, how can they progress upwards? How, how do you choose to be a good dog or a good rat or a good flower? How? It doesn't mean anything. And since there is no means to do that, there is no means to progress from the lower forms to the higher forms, which calls into question the whole idea of reincarnation that you can progress through these levels. Brothers and sisters in Islam, look at the story in the Quran as an example, whether you believe it or not. Of course, as Muslims, we believe this is true. It's not a story, it's history. It's part of our human history. But for those who are not Muslim, understand a conceptual angle. Think about the concept that is important here. The story of two of the sons of Adam. Traditionally in the Bible, it's called Cain and Abel. In fact, the Quran does not contain their names. The name is not important, but there were two sons of Adam. One of them made an offering to God and it was accepted. And God was pleased with that person's offering, that son of Adam's offering. 
And the other one also made an offering, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not accept it and was not pleased with it. So out of jealousy, the one whose offering was not accepted killed his brother, killed, murdered his brother. And this was the first murder that ever took place in human history. And the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that the worst of the two sons of Adam has a share in every single murder that took place since then. Since he initiated and he began murder, every single murder is an imitation of that. And because it is an imitation of it, he gets part of the punishment of every murder. This is what the Prophet ﷺ said, whoever initiates an evil deed, whoever initiates an evil deed, they will get the punishment of whoever follows that evil deed without those people's punishment being diminished in the least. So if I encourage you to do something evil, if I encourage you to do something evil, I will get punished for all of your sin and you will get punished for your sin as well. Think about that brothers and sisters. Think about that as we talk about our journey, our journey to Allah. Think about the consequences of your actions. Think that there are things that you can do and that you can say, and you may not even understand how terrible it is, but because of it, Allah sinks you to the deepest part of the hellfire. Because maybe you initiated an evil, and from that evil, thousands, millions of people may follow you in misguidance, and you will have to take the responsibility of that on the day of judgment. How does that work in the system of reincarnation? How do we account for that in karma? since the effect of deeds can only be realized in reality when the whole of human history has finished. And the opposite way as well, if you encourage people to do a good deed, if you encourage people to do good, then the people who follow you in that good, you will get rewarded for encouraging them. Every good deed they do, you will get benefit from it without their reward being diminished. They will get their reward but you will get rewarded from that as well. So these are some of the ideas concerning the journey that is life. But we believe as Muslims that we are on a journey to Allah. Death is not the final destination. Death is not the end of the journey. No, indeed in reality, this life is only the opportunity in order to gather the provision that we need in order to reach the desired destination. And the desired destination is to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to be entered into his paradise and to be able to look upon the face of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is the most beautiful thing in paradise more beautiful than the food and the drink, more beautiful than the Hur al Ain, more beautiful than the streams of milk and wine and honey. The most beautiful thing for the people in Jannah will be that they will be able to look upon the face of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That my brothers and sisters is the true destination. That is the true journey. So the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, what do I have to do? What do I have to do with the life of this world? I am like a traveler on a journey who takes rest underneath the shade of a tree and then continues on his journey. What a beautiful hadith. Very important saying of the Prophet ﷺ. Let's repeat it again. What do I have to do? Meaning the Prophet ﷺ, he said, why should I be concerned with the life of this world? Why do I need to be concerned with accumulating 
wealth and prestige and children and, 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 and goods and possessions. What need do I have for this world and the life of this world? And then he gives this description, a description that applies to all of us. I am like a traveler. And you know, brothers and sisters, I want us to imagine how traveling was in the time of the Prophet ﷺ. Traveling was very hard. Journeying was very difficult. And those journeys, especially you can imagine, through the desert, no food, no water, maybe traveling for weeks on end. So this is the type of journey we should imagine. A journey on camels, a journey on horses. And the Prophet ﷺ, he gives the example, the life of this world. What is the life of this world like? Our time on this earth is like when you are on a long journey, you stop and you take rest underneath the shade of a tree. That's it. That's our life. It's like taking a rest underneath the shade of the tree. Then you get up and you continue your journey. Our life, our existence, the soul of the human being, and I don't mean just your bodily existence in this earth, the existence of our souls, the whole journey of our entire existence, which is not the life of this world. The life of this world, our stay on this planet is like being on a long journey and you just take rest underneath the shade of the tree and you continue on your journey. So let's imagine this subject of the journey. Let us imagine this subject of the journey. Why do you take rest underneath the shade of a tree? You're on a long journey, one week, two week. You're traveling from A to B. Brothers and sisters, if you think about it, you need to take that rest. You need to sit underneath the shade of a tree. Imagine you're traveling for two weeks nonstop and you don't take any rest. Think about it. What would happen to you? I think after three days of sitting on your camel or on your horse, eventually you'd fall asleep and then maybe you'd fall off and your horse or your camel would keep going. You'd be left there. You'd be like that hadith where the Prophet وسلم, where he described the man who gets off his camel and he goes to sleep. He wakes up in the morning and his camel is gone and he's in the desert. So he realizes he's going to die. He can't survive without his camel, which has all the provisions, which has all the means that he needs in order to reach his destination. It has the food, it has the clothes, it has the water. He needs the transport. He can't make it on his own. And he realizes, so literally he lies down in order to die. And then he wakes up and he finds his camel right next to him. So he jumps up with joy. He's so happy, he jumps up and he says, Oh Allah, you are my servant and I am your Lord. And he, he only gets mixed up because he's so excited. He's so excited, he mixes his words up. He says, Allah is the servant, astaghfirullah, and you are my Lord. But he means to say, oh Allah, you are my Lord and I am your servant. But he gets mixed up because he's so excited. The Prophet wasallam said that Allah is more pleased with the repentance, with the tawbah, with the istighfar, with you seeking forgiveness for your sins, Allah is more pleased with the repentance of his slave when he commits sins than this man is finding his camel. Can you imagine how pleased Allah is when we commit sins and then we ask him and beg him and plead with him to forgive us our sins? and we return to him in repentance and we change our ways, Allah is more pleased than this man is from finding his camel. And you can imagine how pleased that man is going to be. Brothers and sisters, we go back to our analogy. You take rest underneath the shade of a tree. If you don't take that rest, you will fall off your camel, you'll fall off your horse, and you will probably die. So you need the rest. 
You need to take that rest in order to continue on your journey and reach your destination. I suppose if you could get to the destination without resting, without eating, without drinking, if that destination was important enough, and if that destination was worthwhile enough, well, maybe you would just keep going without stopping, without resting. But you need to, even if you're driving your car, it can only go so far before you need to refuel. Even an airplane can go only so far before it needs to refuel and the pilots need a changeover to take a rest. That's the reality. Our journeys have limits. We need to stop. We need to rest. Not because we want to, because we have to in order to reach the destination. And that is the life of this world. The life of this world, it does not mean, brothers and sisters, the life of this world is rest. No, not at all. It doesn't mean that the life of this world is rest. That is not what it means. In fact, quite the opposite. This life of this world is struggling. The life of this world is striving. But what it means is that you don't have any business putting all your effort and all your concentration and all your energy into this worldly life. Because what would you think of this man who is journeying to a fantastic destination, to a beautiful city with his home and his wife and his children and springs of water and nice food and he sits under a tree that barely gives him enough shade. And then he starts to, you know, build a kitchen and he starts to make, you know, a house. And in fact, within three hours, he has to continue on his journey within five hours. But no, he starts to build himself something there. And what can he build anyway on a tree in the desert? Nothing. But he makes all his effort into building and making himself so comfortable underneath the shade of this tree. You say this man is silly. Why are you making all of this effort? Take your rest, take what you need and go and reach your destination. But that is like us. This is like us in this dunya. We're only here for a minute. We're only here for a few hours, like a moment of a day. That's how it's going to seem when we stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A day of judgment, the day of judgment, a day like 50,000 years, brothers and sisters. What is this life going to be like compared to that day when we meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? This life is a moment. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is saying, what business do I have with this world? I just take what I need. I just take in what I need. And what do we need, brothers and sisters? What do we need from the life of this world? What do we need? What is it that we need to take? It's essential. There's something we need. If we don't take it, we will not reach our destination of paradise. We will not reach our destination and we will not see the face of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala unless we take this thing. It's impossible. So this life of the world is the opportunity to take what we need in order to reach our destination. And what we need to take brothers and sisters, what we need to take from this world, that is very important. That is what we need to study. What we need from the life of this world are good deeds. What we need from the life of this world are good deeds that are based upon Iman. Good deeds that are based upon faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and following his guidance, which he gave to his messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That is what we need from the life of this world. But we need to understand this topic and it is very, very important. And that is what I want to continue to discuss, my dear brothers and sisters. And in order to do that, I want to read you some very, very important hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So the first hadith, and they all have a very similar meaning. The first hadith was collected by Bukhari and on the authority of Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, he said, your actions alone will not save any of you. Your actions alone will not save any of you. They asked, Messenger of Allah, not even you. And the Prophet wasallam said, not even me, unless Allah was to envelop me in his mercy. 
Be firm, steadfast and balanced and journey to Allah. In the beginning of the day, the end of the day and a portion at the last part of the night. Moderation, moderation. Through this you will attain your goal. In another narration, the Prophet ﷺ said, This religion is easy. None makes it hard upon himself, except that it overwhelms him. Therefore be firm, steadfast and balanced, upon which have glad tidings. Seek help in this by journeying to Allah at the beginning of the day, at the end of the day, and at the last part of the night. And in another narration, very similar narration, on the authority of Aisha, the Prophet ﷺ said, very similar hadith, be firm, be steadfast and balanced, and have glad tidings. For indeed, actions alone will not cause you to enter paradise. They asked Messenger of Allah, not even you. And he وسلم, said, not even me, unless Allah were to envelop me in his forgiveness and mercy. And in another narration, we'll just add the bit that the best deeds that are most loved by Allah are the deeds that are done continuously and regularly, even if they are little. This is what the Prophet وسلم, said. And we really need to discuss this very, very important hadith, my dear brothers and sisters, because in many ways, it goes against the practice of many Muslims. It goes against the ideas that many Muslims have concerning what is important and how we should do our deeds. We might imagine that doing many, many acts of worship, fasting a lot, praying a lot, doing a lot of dhikr, giving huge amounts of charity, that this is the way to journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But that, my brothers and sisters, is contradicted by what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said. This is contradicted by what we have read here. Now you may be thinking, wait a minute, doesn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tell us in the Quran that when the people go into paradise, the angels will say, this is the garden which you have been made to inherit because of what you used to do. Bima kuntum ta'alamun, the Arabic says, Bima kuntum ta'alamun, because of what you used to do. So Allah is saying, and that's in uh, Surah Al-Zukhruf, which is the 43rd Surah, in the 72nd Ayah. So doesn't Allah say, don't, don't want the angels be saying to the people in paradise, come to paradise because of what you used to do. And there are many other verses of a similar import. Didn't the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say and mention in various hadith how the people will be standing in front of Allah, they will see the hellfire in front of them, the hellfire behind them, the hellfire to their sides. And didn't the Prophet say, save yourself from hellfire even with a date or half a date, or if not that, a kind word. So isn't it deeds? that save us from paradise? How do we reconcile what Allah has said with what the Prophet ﷺ said? And this is very, very important to understand, my dear brothers and sisters. First of all, there is a very easy way to reconcile this. And there are two opinions concerning the scholars. Some of them say, no, you don't enter into paradise because of your deeds. It is because of the mercy of Allah. What you deeds do is they give you or they, they are according to your level in paradise. So the more deeds you do, the higher your level in paradise. And there are several reasons why this is not the most convincing explanation. The most convincing explanation is the second. And that is that the deeds are the means. They are not the cause. The cause is the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But Allah has made your good deeds the means through which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mercy upon you. So you don't get paradise because of your deeds. You get paradise because of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But it is your deeds 
your works of righteousness that lead to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala having mercy upon you. It's very important to understand, my brothers and sisters, for many different reasons, that you should not become amazed at your deeds. You should not become amazed at your worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You should never imagine that you could get to paradise by doing so much good because you can't. And just think about it. Think about it for a minute. Think about it for a moment, my brothers and sisters. Contemplate on it. Do you think that you can earn paradise? Do you think that you can earn it? Do you think you can buy paradise? Think about paradise. Think about it. Living there forever. You will never get old. You'll never get thirsty. You'll never be hungry. Rivers of wine, milk and honey. The food, the clothing, the joy, the happiness, the peace, the tranquility. Do you think you can buy that with your deeds? No, of course not, brothers and sisters. Of course you can't buy it with your deeds. You could never do enough good to actually buy paradise. Because the beauty of paradise is beyond whatever we could amass with our wealth. This is the reality. And even, even your ability to do good deeds itself is a mercy from Allah. Think about that. Even your ability to do good deeds is a gift and a mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Could you have been guided if Allah did not guide you? Could you have known the straight path unless Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had shown it to you? Would you have the ability to perform good deeds if Allah did not give you the intelligence and the strength and the Iman? No, even doing good deeds itself is a gift and a mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what a beautiful gift and what a beautiful mercy. Because Allah does not need our deeds. Allah does not need our prayer or our fasting or our zakah or our hajj. Allah does not need it. Allah is self-sufficient. These have been given to us because they are good for us, because they make our life better, because they make us more happy as human beings, because they lighten our heart and our soul and give us peace and tranquility. They unify us as believers and help us to build successful and harmonious societies. All of these things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us, including the halal and the haram is for our benefit anyway. So even this guidance and these good deeds are a mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So how can you earn paradise? Even the money you give in charity, tell me, when you give charity, who does that money really belong to? Who does the money belong to? It belongs to Allah. That money belongs to Allah. So you're only giving to Allah what already belongs to Allah in the first place. True or not? Subhanallah. Yet that's the mercy of Allah. That's the mercy of Allah. Allah lets you spend His money in His cause and rewards you for it. Subhanallah. So don't imagine that you can earn Jannah. The deeds and doing the good deeds is a way to the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Brothers and sisters, this is to understand, so we should understand the smallest of Allah's blessings. If we were to prostrate to Allah and stay in sajda to Allah for the entirety of our life and never leave that sajda, we would not have thanked of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as, as He deserves to be thanked. We would not have done it. So we are not going to enter paradise by our deeds, but it is rather by the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what we are facing at the end of this journey, brothers and sisters, and this is very important. We are either facing the forgiveness of Allah or the fire. Either the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or the fire. This is what we are facing. So what is important, brothers and sisters, and this is why this hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it's so important, it is so, so important. And so many Muslims have gone astray from misunderstanding these things. And we find we are always falling into extremes. Either we, we are extremely lazy or we go to the other extreme. And there is the extreme of neglect, a Muslim who is neglectful. 
This is not the balanced way. This is not being firm and this is not being steadfast. This is not Sadidu wa Karibu. This is the words the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used. Sadidu and Karibu. Sadidu means to be firm and to be steadfast. And Karibu means to be balanced and moderate. And this is how we should be. This religion is easy. This religion, we have an easy religion. Allah did not give us the religion of monasticism. He did not give us the religion of extremes. This is not our deen. And there were amongst his companions, people who had this inclination to go to extremes. Like those three young men who went to the family of the Prophet ﷺ. And they said amongst themselves, who are we? The Prophet Muhammad, the Prophet of Allah, the Messenger of Allah, Allah has forgiven his sins from before and his sins from after. Who are we? So they went and they asked. And after asking, this is what they said. So one of them said, I am going to fast every day. The other one said, I will never sleep in the night. I'm going to pray all night, every night. The other one said, I am never going to marry. And when the Prophet ﷺ heard this, he was angry. And he called the people, he called them. He said, who is such and such, Fulan and Fulan, who says this and that? Verily, I fear Allah the most of all of you. And I fast some days and I don't fast other days. And I sleep in the night and I pray in the night. And I marry the women. So whoever does not follow my sunnah has nothing to do with me. Brothers and sisters, what a severe warning against extremism in the religion. As you find these people going to extremes in all sorts of areas, extremes in worship, extremes in asceticism. But that's not our deen. We have not been given that religion. And this is what the Prophet ﷺ said. Similarly, there was a man standing in the sun. He was standing in the masjid, standing in the sun, and he was not talking to anyone. The Prophet ﷺ said, what is wrong with this man? They said, oh, messenger of Allah, he took an oath to fast, to stand in the sun, and not to speak to anyone. The Prophet ﷺ said, tell him to sit down in the shade and talk to the people and keep his fast. This man was, he was inclining towards extremism. Allah has not taught us standing in the sun, standing and not sitting, not talking to people like this, taking vows. This is not our religion. Allah has shown us through the Prophet ﷺ, the beautiful balanced way. And think about it, brothers and sisters. What is the difference between us and Abu Bakr? You know, there may be some of us, we pray more than Abu Bakr. We fast more than Abu Bakr. Maybe we give more charity even than Abu Bakr. What is the difference between us and him? Why is he closer to Allah and always will be than any of us? What is the difference? The difference is the heart, brothers and sisters. The difference is what is in his heart. It is his love for Allah. That is what is different. His love for Allah, his ikhlas, his sincerity towards Allah and towards the people. This was the difference between the Sahaba and us. Not in the amount of their deeds, not in the number of their deeds, but the quality. The quality, brothers and sisters, the quality of loving Allah, fearing Allah, not caring for the life of this world, but being focused on the Akhirah, focused on the Akhirah. They could have had this dunya. They could have, but they didn't care for it at all because they were focused on the Akhirah. And their hearts were hearts that loved Allah, were sincere to Him. And this is what is important, brothers and sisters. The quality of your deeds, the quality of your deeds, your love for Allah, your sincerity to Him, your seeking His forgiveness and making tawbah and returning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is how we should be. This is the manner in which we should be, my dear brothers and sisters. And be continuous and persistent and patient and steadfast. Do good deeds, yes. And it does not mean that life is not a struggle. It does not mean that that journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to be a struggle. It is going to be a struggle. It is going to be hard. But your soul, your soul, this is what is going to carry you. Your nafs, your soul is going to carry you. It's like your transport. It's like your camel. It's like your horse. 
That's what you need to ride in order to reach that destination. And you know what, brothers and sisters? If you beat the horse and beat the horse and beat the horse and make it gallop and gallop and gallop, okay, in the beginning you will reach a long distance. Dear brothers and sisters in Islam, do good deeds, yes. And it does not mean that life is not a struggle. It does not mean that that journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to be a struggle. It is going to be a struggle. It is going to be hard. But your soul, your soul, this is what is going to carry you. Your nafs, your soul is going to carry you. It's like your transport. It's like your camel. It's like your horse. That's what you need to ride in order to reach that destination. And you know what, brothers and sisters? If you beat the horse and beat the horse and beat the horse and make it gallop and gallop and gallop, okay, in the beginning, you will reach a long distance. But you know what? If you keep doing that, your animal will die. It will not be able to accomplish it. And many people make this mistake. This is why the Prophet ﷺ advised one of his companions. He said, O Messenger of Allah, advise me concerning my fasting and reading the Quran. So the Prophet ﷺ advised him, fast on the Mondays and fast on the Thursdays. He said, no, I can do better than that. And he said, well, you know, at the very most, you fast one day and break fast the other day. That's the most you can do. And again, concerning reading the Quran, the Prophet ﷺ advised him, read what the Quran once a month. He said, I can do better. And I kept saying, I can do better. He said, anyway, the maximum is once every three days because you will not be able to understand it otherwise. And you know what? This same companion, he, when he was older, he regretted. He said, I wish I had listened to the advice of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because when he was older, he didn't have the strength, but he hated to abandon the good deeds that he used to do in the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Why? Because the Prophet encouraged to be steadfast and continuous and regular in your deeds. So think now about your good deeds. Think now about it. Yes, appoint for yourself good deeds and you need it on your journey. You need it to reach Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But be moderate, be steadfast. Don't be extreme. Don't be extremely lazy or don't go extreme to the other side. And brothers and sisters, we are so much in need of understanding this beautiful wisdom today. Because we find this is many of us, we go to this extreme or that extreme. But you should be moderate and balanced. This deen is very strong. This deen is very strong. You can't overcome it like that. So be moderate and balanced and steadfast and do continuous deeds. And the Prophet ﷺ said, the morning and the evening and the part of the night. So this is what we should do. In the morning after Fajr is a good time to read the Quran, make dua and make dhikr. After Asr, similarly, that is the time and it is preferred by the way. The latter part is better than the early parts. Again, read Quran, make dhikr, do some good deeds. And in the last part of the night, of course, which is a very, very important and beautiful time to pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when Allah descends to the lowest heaven. And we are closer to Allah and Allah is more responding to our dua at that time. So brothers and sisters, very briefly, I want to finish. Be careful of those things that will destroy and nullify your deeds. Many people are going to be in for a big surprise when they meet Allah on the day of judgment. And Allah mentions that there will appear to them something from their lords that they never expected. On the day of judgment, people will come and something will happen. They will never expect their deeds will be destroyed. And number one, it is because you think you are doing something good and it is not. Good is following the path of the Prophet with knowledge and understanding. This is what you need more than a lot of ibadah. It is better that you do what is sunnah, what is right based on knowledge with sincerity and perfection in the deed. This is what you need. Not lots and lots of ibadah according to bid'ah and innovations. These people will be surprised. They will meet Allah on the day of judgment. They think they have done something good, but it will not be good. The other thing is doing an evil deed, which you think is nothing. You do something evil and you think nothing of it. Be careful of doing evil, which you think is nothing. How about the next, which is worse than that? The worst thing than that 
is a person who does evil thinking it is good. That is even worse. And then showing off, doing your deeds for display, harming others, oppressing them so your deeds will be taken away on the Day of Judgment and given to them. Doing evil deeds that will destroy your good deeds. Brothers and sisters, I finish with a hadith of the Prophet On the Day of Judgment, there will be people who have come with mountains of good deeds, but they will be like scattered dust. Those mountains of good deeds will be like scattered dust. They prayed and they fasted and they gave charity and they prayed in the night, but they did not fear Allah in secret. In secret, they committed sins. Brothers and sisters, let us not be from those people whose deeds are ruined. Let us be moderate, steadfast, balanced, in our deeds and that is the way we will reach our destination Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala paradise bi'ibnillah with the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wa jazakallah khair wa assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa